So again, welcome. Uh, we're so happy that you're here today. Um, today, my sermon title is Count It All Joy. We're going to be starting the book of James. We'll be in the book of James probably for the next couple of months. We're going to go chapter by chapter, verse by verse. But today, I wanted to spend a little bit of time and talk about this author, who James is, and, and why he wrote it. And uh, we'll just take our time doing that. Um, but so we'll be today we'll be in the very first chapter of James. We're only going to look at four verses. It's in your bulletin as well on the back. In fact, on the back of your bulletin, you'll also find some of the notes for today as well. So as we go along, that will help you uh, stay with us. So let's go ahead and take a look at uh, the book of James beginning in uh, verse 1. And it says this. It says, James, a bondservant of God, and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad. Greetings. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. So like many of the New Testament books, they start off by the name of the author. You know, it's, it's Paul writing somewhere. This is James writing to, to, to his, the people that are receiving this letter. And that's the way the ancients used to do it. Now, there's no ancients here, okay? We're talking about a long, long time ago. This is, this is the way that people always wrote letters. They'd start off by telling it who they were before. Now, we don't do that today, do we? We usually write our name at the end of a letter. But see, you're not as clever as you think you are because you have a return address on the envelope. So people opening up the envelope already know it, who it's from, right? If you get email today, you know the e who the email is coming from before you e open, open the email. If you have a cell phone and you have, you have a, a caller ID, you take a look who's calling you and sometimes you don't even answer, okay? You know, he, he can go to voicemail, right? So, so we know who it is. Well, in the time that James is writing this, it was very important for James to let people know who he was that was writing the letter. And we know this because when Paul was writing to the, second, to the, the Thessalonians, in 1 Thessalonians, Thessalonians, he says that other people had sent letters disguised saying that they were from Paul. So James, it's very important that James wants to identify who he is. So who is this character named James? Well, there's a number of people named James in the New Testament. It was a very common name in first century, um, first, century, uh, first century Jerusalem. The name actually comes from Jacob, which is the name of Israel. So you could, in fact, in some modern translations, it says this is the letter of Jacob, because the letter Jacob in, in Hebrew is the same as our James in English. So there's a number of different James in the, in the, in the New Testament. The uh, tradition as well as biblical evidence points that this book was actually written by who, who, the guy whose name is James the Just. James the Just. Now this James was the half-brother of Jesus. That's in Matthew 13, 55. And he led the church in Jerusalem. He was the bishop of Jerusalem. He's also the brother of Jude, and Jude wrote the book of Jude. Now, for those of you that may not have known that Jesus had siblings, let me spend just a few minutes on what the Bible actually teaches us. We start off where we left off during our Christmas services. And as you recall, we read the scriptures where the angel Gabriel came to Mary. Remember that? Angel Gabriel came to Mary and said, and Mary, now who's a virgin at the time, said to the angel, how will this be since I do not know a man? The angel replied, the Holy Spirit will come upon you power of the Holy, the Most High will overshadow you, and the Holy One will be born, will be called the Son of God. So he's the Son of God, so that's why any brother of James would be considered the half-brother, because the true Father of Jesus Christ is none other than God Almighty. And that's usually where we end our Christmas readings. However, if you go on, the angel Gabriel also appears to Joseph and tells Joseph that it's okay to take Mary as his wife because what's conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit, okay? So Joseph does as the angel tells him, but it goes on, and this is what it says. It says, and he, that's Joseph, did not know her until she had brought forth a son and called his name Jesus. Now, that's the New King James, King James, Berean translation. It says he did not know her. Know her is one of those words that's used often in the Bible. It talks about an intimacy. Uh, just to make sure you know what he's talking, the Bible's talking about, if you have an NIV, it says, but he did not, that's Joseph, did not consummate 
their marriage until after Mary had given birth to Jesus. So it's very, very clear from the Bible that normal marital relations were between Joseph and Mary. Now, this shouldn't surprise most of us. Now, if you have a Catholic background, it's a little bit different because they've taught what's called the perpetual virginity of Mary. And God bless them, that's, that's okay. I mean, that doesn't change anything what the gospel has to say. It just, try, we're trying to identify who this James is. And, and the point is this, is that no time in history has a man and a woman decided to get married where the woman decided that she was going to remain a virgin. Okay, that, that isn't part of normal marital relations. That's just not done. The Bible implies that a normal marital relationship began after Jesus was born. Now, Jesus' brothers are mentioned in, in the scriptures. He had four brothers. He had James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas. James is mentioned um, three times. Those, those brothers are mentioned three times, and James is always the first, meaning he most likely was the eldest of the siblings. The Bible also mentioned that Jesus had sisters. Now, James is mentioned first. It was James that the apostle Paul mentions that the risen Lord appeared to. After Jesus rose from the dead, Paul is talking about that he appeared to me, he appeared to some of the other, to some women. He also appeared to James. And it, many scholars believe that this is what caused James to change his opinion on about his older brother. Remember the, the siblings, of, in fact, the family of Jesus wasn't too sure about this Messiah thing. I mean, remember, there's a couple times in Scripture that it hints that the family thought that he might be mad. And Jesus said, well, who is my mother? Who is my father? Who are my siblings? You know, here's my brothers. So there's, a, there's an indication there that the family wasn't too sure. And you can understand that. I mean, if you, brought, if you were brought up and you had an older brother and all of a sudden your older brother decided that he was the son of God, that would be a cause of concern. That would be a cause of concern. And this is what James had to go through. But the risen Lord appeared to James. And this is what turned James from a stepbrother or a half-brother of Jesus to the great apostle James, the disciple of the Lord, fully committed into serving God. Now, before we go on, it's likely, again, some of you have not heard that Jesus had children or Jesus, or Jesus had any brothers and sisters. And the reason is what's called the a doctrine called the perpetual uh, virginity of Mary. And again, that's that's fine. It's just not the understanding of many in the early church. Uh, for example, uh, James, this James uh, was the presiding bishop in Jerusalem in 48 AD. And we see him uh, give the final decision. Uh, if you were with us when we went through the book of Acts, in Acts 15, there was the Council of Jerusalem. And Paul and Barnabas travel back to Jerusalem to tell them about the great success they had with the Gentiles. And Peter comes out and says, I don't think that we should put any burden on them. And then James comes out, this is that same James, that comes out and gives the final decision. He was the bishop of the church in, in Jerusalem. Now, outside the Bible, we have also what we call extra-biblical evidence or extra-biblical references. Uh, and we can look to a couple of people. For example, Clement of Alexandria, uh, which wrote about 175 AD. And there was a guy named Eusebius, which was a Christian uh, pastor as well as a historian, uh, wrote about, uh, lived about 50 years later. Both identified that it was this James, the brother of the Lord, that was the bishop of the Church of Jerusalem prior to his death in 62 AD. Now, while we're talking about extra-biblical references. Let me read to you from Josephus. You probably have heard the name Josephus before. Josephus wrote a couple different volumes. He was an historian and he wrote what was called the Antiquity of the Jews. It speaks of the high priest in Jerusalem whose name was Hanan ben Hanan or Hanan son of Hanan who was a high priest and he, had st he stoned James. And this is what it says. Hanan ben Hanan who as we've been told you already took the high priesthood he was a bold man, and he had a temper, and he was insolent. He was also rigid of the sect of the Sadducees, who are very rigid in judging offenders above all else of the Jews, above the rest of the Jews. As we have already discovered, when therefore Hannah was of this disposition, means that he was violent and insolent and had a temper, he thought how he now had the proper authority or opportunity to exercise his authority. Festus was now dead. If you remember, we talked about Festus. Festus was one that tried Paul, and Festus died. And Albinius was now upon the road, so he assembled the Sanhedrin of judges and brought before them the brother of Jesus, 
who was called Christ, whose name was James, and some others, or some of his companions. And when he had formed an accusation against them as breakers of the law, he delivered them to be stoned. Isn't that interesting? So we have really good biblical evidence of exactly who this James is, what his role was in the church. By the way, we know that Festus, because the Romans wrote about it, <laughs> Festus was the procreator of Jerusalem at the time, and he died in 62 AD. So we have a really good idea of exactly when this James was stoned to death because it's recorded that it was shortly after Festus had died. This is how the Bible was put together, by the way. I mean, if you're interested in where do these books come from, this is exactly what it is. These are letters that early leaders in the church wrote, mainly Paul, James, Peter, uh, Silas, a few of these early, uh, early um, uh, disciples uh, wrote letters and they circulated throughout the church. And then the church was assembling these things and those that had the greatest evidence, like the book of James, were included in what you have now in your hand as, as the Bible. So we know who the author is. Now let's talk about a little bit about why he wrote it. Uh, the scholars generally agree that James wrote this around 45 AD, just before the Council of Jerusalem. There's no references to the Council of Jerusalem. There's no references to Paul in this at all. So it's one of the early letters. In fact, that's why we're now taking a look at it. Uh, scholars typically believe that the first letter that was written to the new church was written by Paul. That was 1 Thessalonians, around 44, 45 AD. And most likely this letter, if it didn't precede it, immediately came right after it. It was written by James around the same time. This is only 15, 12 to 13 years after Jesus died. So this is a very early letter in the church. Um, why he wrote this letter is actually captured in the very first verse. Verse says this, verse 1 says this, it says, James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad. Greetings. You know, I love it that James is calling himself a, the bondservant, the bondservant of, of, of Jesus, of, of God and of Je the Lord Jesus Christ. He could have said, hey, I'm his younger brother, right? Okay, I'm the guy that he appeared to, but he's not using that. He's using the word Bond servant. Now, this word bond servant is used often in the Bible. The Greek word there is doulos, and people that have studied this a lot knows that every time the word servant is used in the Bible, in the New Testament, it's typically this word doulos. The issue is, is that the true translation for doulos means slave. Means slave. So what James is saying is this, is he's saying, Jesus is my master. I am now not his half-brother. I'm not, his, I'm not just his sibling, I am his bondservant. I've committed my life to the Lord Jesus. This is what I have to do. And you know, that's actually what God has called all of us to do. God has called all of us to be servants, to be bond slaves to Jesus Christ. But by the way, the church history tells us a little bit more about James. Now this is anecdotal evidence, but anecdotally he was called camel knees. And the reason that James was called camel knees is because he prayed so much that his knees actually had very thick calluses on them. Isn't that something? So he, had, he was called camel knees. I think that's, that's very endearing, isn't it? I would love to be called camel knees. I just, I don't have that, I don't have that habit, unfortunately. So, so James writes this letter to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad. Now, there's some alternative understandings of what this means. You know, some scholars teach that basically the 12 tribes is just another name to say the church abroad. That's not, that's not the way I understand it. Um, when you really take a look at this, this idea of the 12 tribes being scattered, uh, the Jewish people all the way going back to the first dispersion understood that there were 12 tribes that were scattered. If you remember, the Assyrians came in and they sacked the northern tribes, okay, and, and they took them off to Assyria, and that was the 10 northern tribes. And then about 120, 130 years later, the Babylonians come in under Nebuchadnezzar and they take the remaining two tribes from Judah. That's Benjamin and Judah. And we can track that through the Old Testament. In fact, those two tribes come back. Even though those, the, we don't have a record of the 10 tribes coming back, the Jewish people to this day consider that they are scattered of the 12 tribes, the 12 tribes. In the book of Revelation, it talks about the 12 tribes, that there would be 12,000 from each one of the tribes. So this euphemism of the 12 tribes, James is using, but he's using it in a special way. 
Because if you remember, right after, right after uh, Stephen was stoned, the, the Christians in Jerusalem scattered. And this is what the Bible says. It says, on that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Okay, that's in Acts chapter 8, verse 1. Um, this word scattered, by the way, is the Greek word diaspora. It's the word diaspora, which is exactly what we refer to with the Jewish diaspora. It's the scattering of the Jews. So it's the same word that's used in Acts. It's the same word that James is using as well. So he's referring to the scattering of the Christians because of the persecution in Jerusalem. Now, you find that interesting? I, I do. I mean, I, I've always loved history, and I, and I love seeing this and seeing this in the Bible and being reflected in the Bible. So let's go on. Verse 2 says this. It says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. James says, count it all joy. Now, that's the title of my message. Aren't you glad? It's, uh, it's about half, a, half hour into this message, and we're finally getting to the name of the topic today. It's count it all. This is what happens when I have history to talk about, right? We could talk about it all day. Count it all joy. So, you know, it's interesting. This, this Christmas season, and I've got to attribute some of this to, to my wife. This, this Christmas season, season, my wife and I have been watching a lot of the Hallmark movies. Have you been? Okay, show of hands. I mean, people. Okay, lots, almost every hand's going up. Lots of Hallmark. There's two Hallmark channels, right? And you can watch them 24 hours a day, right? From Thanksgiving all the way beginning of November all the way through the Christmas season. I think you could still catch some today. So we watched a lot of them. And, you know, here, there's a thing. These are, these are great movies to watch for a lot of reasons. Number one, they're all rated G, right? There's, there's no violence other than snowballs. Uh, there's no bad language. And even, even the couple that always falls in love, we know who they're going to be, right? At the beginning, we know who the couple's going to be, even if they're engaged to other people. We know who they're going to fall in love. Now, they get engaged by the end, or they sometimes even get married by the end of the show. They don't even kiss until the last 10 minutes of the movie. I mean... This is, this is, these are great movies, okay? Now, now, also, the other thing is, is there's always a misunderstanding, right? Somewhere about three quarters of the way through the movie, there's a misunderstanding. Uh, the gal or the, or the girl hears something that somebody says, and they think, oh, it's not going to work out. It's just a misunderstanding. And that, that's cleared up, and they get engaged, and they kiss. It's, it's kind of fun. <laughs> so the reason I bring this up... <laughs> You can see my wife had, had a lot of help in the sermon today. So, so the reason I bring this up is because I find that there's a lot in common, a lot in common between the intentions of these producers, these writers of these Hallmark movies, and James, and the writer of this letter of James. And you say, well, I find that interesting. Well, don't get me wrong. I mean, their intentions are similar, but sometimes their motives are completely polar opposite. Now, the reason is this, is James, the book of James, is a very practical book. It's like the Old Testament book of Proverbs. It tells us how to live life. It encourages us as God's people to act like God's people, and to pursue not what we think is the right thing to do, but what God says is the right thing to do. So here's how I see that the book of James and these Hallmark movies are similar. You've got to stay with me here. So in the Hallmark movie, Christmas comes twice. A newscaster goes back in time to get a second chance to do the right thing. In a very merry mix-up, a woman spends the holiday with the wrong family, but realizes she also has the wrong fiancé. In, in a Christmas detour, another woman gets stuck in a snowstorm, can't be, get back to her fiancé and his family, but finds out that her fiancé and his family have completely different values than she does. In A Dream of Christmas, another woman who is actually the same woman that we saw in A Very Merry Christmas, um, <laughs> wishes to be single again, but she finds out it's really not the life that she thought it should be. 
Now, and all of it, now don't get me started on the princess, okay? The princess and the kings and the princesses. I mean, they all end up the same, right? They're walking around and all of us were gallery and stuff like that and, and all kinds of crowns and things like that. And they all have a British accent. I think that's kind of funny. Regardless of where they are in Europe or what country this is, they all have this British accent. And they're all similar movies because all of the royalty finds out that their values and the values of the common people are actually much more, they have much more in common. And actually that people need to be people and they need to be true to who they truly are. So this is what James is actually telling us in these opening verses. In the title of my message today, Count It All Joy. He said, when, not if, you fall into various trials. At the same time, these are occasions for joy, not discouraged resignation. Life is actually like a Hallmark movie. Life will throw you a curve. There's going to be detours. There's going to be snowstorms. There's going to be times when you're stranded. We count it all joy in the midst of the trials because they test us. They force us to understand what is truly important in life. God actually uses them, and this is what the Bible says, to produce character, patience, and godliness. And this is what James says at the end of verse 3. He says, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. Faith is tested through trials. Faith is not produced by fear. You have to have faith to get through the trials. Trials reveal what faith we do have, not because God needs to see our faith, but we need to rise above our fears, and we need to exhibit the faith that will be so evident to not only ourselves, but to all of those around us. And James concludes with these words. He says this in verse 4. He says, And let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. You know, many believe, and I believe it too, that this is a subtle warning. And the warning is, don't look for the easy way out. Let let testing have its perfect work. Take the time. It's it kind of like, remember that, that old movie, that, that play, um, uh, Joseph and the, the Multicolored Dreamcoat, okay? And one of the songs was, take another lap around Mount Sinai, right? The Jewish people are out in the desert for 40 years, and they can't get it right, and they're being tested, and it's like, take another lap around Mount Sinai. Don't try to take the easy way out. We saw this often in the Bible. Anytime somebody tried to take the easy way out, it wasn't the right way. He wanted to be, be perfect. To, uh, you know, Paul prayed for this as well. Uh, Paul had some type of a tormentor, something. Some people thought it might be Satan. Some people thought it might be some kind of a disease of some kind. And the great apostle Paul prays to the Lord that the Lord would remove it. And this is what the Lord says. He says, my grace is sufficient for you for my power is made perfect in weakness. Now, like me, many of you have experienced these types of trials. And we, we all have. We all understand what it's like to go through trials. But as I look back on my life, especially my Christian life, as I've gone through trials, I don't want the trials to come back. But I do want that closeness that I had with God to come back. You know, it's during the times of trial that I feel the closest to my God, my Savior. The time my wife and I go through trials together, we become closer. I don't want to go through the trial again, but I, but I love that feeling close. I, I love that time, that intimacy that I have with God, the strength of God, the perfection of my faith, and the powerful hand of God guiding me and encouraging me and letting me know that he's, he's with me and that he'll take care of me. Those are times that James says, count it all joy. Count it all joy. For 2022, we need to take our trials and the times that are difficult for us and count it all joy. Let's pray. So Father God, we want to thank you, Lord, for who you are. We thank you, Lord, for these, these trials. We thank